452, Chapter 72 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1543. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 452, Insulated. This episode of Craplet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well. Things are cool again here. And that means I honestly can't tell if the insulation that I've done (laughs) is actually working. But it sure feels nice now. And it's quieter. And I'm not complaining about that at all. And I imagine neither are you. So that's great because today we have a humongous chapter. And it's a kind of odd humongous chapter because it's not a humongous chapter full of massive action. We'll get to it in just a second. But first, we have a lot of activity from listeners So the first thing I want to do is play a voicemail from Kat. This goes back to, I think it was just last episode, where I played her voicemail about the rockery. And I mentioned something about John Proctor, like John Proctor being the guy in The Crucible. Here is her response. Hi, Heather. This is Catherine, Kat CS. Just a follow-up to your question about the Proctor estate in Topsfield. I was wrong. Although there is a connection to the Salem Witch Trials and Topsfield, several residents, women of Topsfield, were accused and a few were hanged during the witch trial. The proctor that purchased land that eventually became the Ipswich Wildlife Sanctuary was Thomas Proctor, not John Proctor. Now, Kath's audio cut off. Strangely, there was still like a minute and a half of audio left on the length of the actual audio file that we got. But for some reason, the phone just stopped. So, Kath, I'm sorry if there was something more that you needed to say. Please call again, and I hope it works. But that was very interesting about it not being uh, John Proctor, Thomas Proctor instead. And it parallels uh, information that my sister and I were talking to my mom about, because we know that we're related. We go back to the Livingstons, the family in New York, and Papa Livingston, (laughs) one of the Livingstons, signed the Declaration of Independence. And one side of the family goes back to him. And I had just seen a sign, a house sign, saying, oh, Livingston, but it was in New Jersey. And so I was kind of curious. And it turns out that there were quite a few Livingstons in both New York and New Jersey, uh, but it's the New York one that we're related to and the signer. So that was kind of cool. But the names, you know, there were, and we've talked about this before, you know, when the population is smaller, And you think about Victorian London, Dickensian London. That is not a small place. That's millions of people. It's still fewer millions than it is now. And so the opportunities for coincidence and for a serendipitous meeting of somebody who knows somebody else is a lot more possible in situations like that. And it's even more so when you get to early America, especially like New Amsterdam America, and even before that. There were so few families that came over, there weren't going to be all that many last names in the beginning. It took a while for us to ramp up to the point where we get Ordovers and things like that. So it makes a lot of sense that there's a lot of Livingstons. I also got several emails, and it makes me so happy to get these because then I know you're listening. I got an email from Elizabeth, and I love the way she wrote this. So Elizabeth, I'm going to read this with what I think was your voice as you were writing this. She wrote, Heather, 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 of course you've heard of bread and salt before. It appears in It's a Wonderful Life when George Bailey and his wife Mary give bread, salt, and wine to a first-time homeowner family. Please tell me you've seen this. And she sent me the clip. And then she followed it up, you know, just in case. Love craft lit. I tell people about it all the time. Cheers. And Elizabeth, I wrote back to you right away. I don't know if you got the email, but I cracked up when I got this from you because 
there are several movies which clearly have a cursed relationship with me, and It's a Wonderful Life is one of them. I always come in when the uncle, Uncle Willie, what's his name, loses the money. That's it. I think I've seen the entire movie once. And so I, I kind of thought, wow, I don't, it sounds kind of familiar. I don't actually remember it. So I watched the clip, which I will put in the show notes so that you can watch the clip too. A uh, vague memory, but not one that would have actually jumped out in my mind. So thank you for filling that in because that is, I am positive, a massive reference point for the bread and salt thing for most of the world for whom there is no curse and they are allowed to see all of It's a Wonderful Life every Christmas. I, I don't know why I don't. It's just a thing. It's like draining watch batteries, which is also a thing. Then I also got an email from Renee, fabulous Renee, our Presbyterian minister in mid-Southern, mid-California, mid fornia She writes, hi, Heather, I don't have any personal knowledge about a Lutheran slash Quaker connection, but I did a Google search about Quaker history in France, and this site popped up. And I will give you the link to this in the show notes because you may be very, very interested in seeing what this has to say. She summarizes for us by saying, it turns out, unsurprisingly, that the Quakers were conscientious objectors in the revolution in France and refused to wear the cockade. This was the, the sign of the military, or at least the allegiance to the uprising and the fight, the struggle. And it was those little rosettes that were red, white, and blue that were made of, um, actually, they look like grosgrain ribbon that was gathered around a central point so it looks like a little rosette, red, white, and blue rosette. So they refused to wear it. My guess is that our guy in Monte Cristo would never have worn an outward sign of military engagement as a Quaker in a time when most would have. And if you don't know a whole lot about Quakers, one of the, the big things that is kind of a generalization that goes along with Quakerism is a devotion to peace, conscientious objection, being against fighting kind of across the board. She said, sorry, I can't help on the Lutheran thing, which seems completely random. Italian cities were heavily Catholic and the Protestant movement would have been dead by this time. And that doesn't, of course, mean Protestantism was dead. It was the big sea change Protestant movement, the, the Lutheranism kind of sweeping Western Europe is what she's, she's referring to. So the Lutheran thing is interesting. And I wrote back to Renee and said, wow, you have Google magic because I wasted a lot of time not finding this piece of information on the Google. So listeners who are living in France and Italy, do let us know if there's some weird Lutheran thing going on. Because the other thing that struck me is this could have been a very subtle thing that Dumas just slipped in. And again, it's such a little thing. Why do I obsess about it? To me, it adds such a, a layer of richness and depth to the writing that Dumas added this. And he hasn't done anything accidentally yet. So I kind of doubt this is accidental. It's just information that is no longer common knowledge. It made me wonder if there was an anti-Lutheran, anti-Quaker, something that was going on the same way that we have seen in various texts, but most notably Elizabeth Gaskell's. We've seen an anti-Irish undertone. I don't know. And I really wouldn't know unless I was there and probably unless I talked to some people who'd been around for a while. Uh, kind of like when my husband went to Slovakia and there's the tower on the hill that I've talked about before, the, the watchtower, the fire mountaintop to mountaintop warning tower in the little town he was in in Slovakia, where he asked for the history, you know, wow, when was that born? It was built in 1100 to keep the Turks out. And these people living in the 20th century at the time still warned him about the Turks. So, you know, in some places, these stories don't really die. They just become either part of the folklore or part of a, a general prejudice. It's one of the things about the, the book American Gods, which is now the Stars TV series, American Gods, originally written by Neil Gaiman, vastly expanded in the TV version from, from the book. But that idea that, especially Americans, we pick up and we move. And first it had to happen to our ancestors. They picked up and left where they were, unless you're Native American. And even if you're Native American, it is possible that the tribe that you were a part of historically was a mobile tribe. There were some that were like anywhere, very sedentary and built permanent structures. And there were others that moved for all sorts of different, very good reasons. But you stayed with your tribe for the most part. 
anybody who came from anywhere else, their families had to decide to pick up and move and come here. And when that happens, often things that drop by the wayside are religion, superstition, generalized prejudices, because all of a sudden you're in a, an environment where those things just don't fit anymore. I said to my husband, and I think I've said it before on the podcast, how very clear it was to me that one of the things that happened during the westward expansion was that some of the stuff that people threw off the wagons were things like religion and biases, stereotypes, things like that, because it just didn't fit. You know, your, your neighbors may be, if you're out as a pioneer, your neighbors may wind up being of the ethnicity or the religious background or the cultural background or the country background that your family was raised to believe were wrong, stupid, bad, evil, other. But now they're your neighbor and you have to rely on them because it's just the two of you out on the prairie. You're stuck. And you even see a little bit of that in Lauren Goes Wilder, if you read the books, which is a long way of saying, I have a sneaking suspicion that this is like the Irish thing in Elizabeth Gaskell. So now I'm even more curious. Just can't let go, can I? It's a flaw. On this topic of biases and prejudices, but also on historical and literary connections to such things, I do have to share a moment with you that was a potentially very tragic one and, in fact, just became kind of a laughable moment. Over the weekend, there was the Pride Parade here in New Hope, which is a very theater, very rainbow-friendly town. and. My husband has run for school board and he, he is on with uh, three other women. There are four of them that ran together. They're on the school board. They're a wonderful crew of people. And one of the things that they were to do was to march in the Pride Parade. So he did that. And then we found out that there was a, a giant hundred foot banner. And I'll put a, two pictures on the show notes. One that made the newspaper that is my son and one that was taken by a drone. And it's just lovely. Both of them are lovely. And it was a lovely day. And so I got to walk along with Thing 2, who was marching in the parade, holding an edge to this ginormous banner. And it was one of those wonderful, joyful days where the weather was cool and the day was bright and green and gorgeous. And the river was absolutely glassy still. and everyone is smiling and everyone is cheering and everyone is laughing and just having a great time. And we got all the way down to the end of the parade route and they stopped us. And the guy who had been driving the, the car in front of us, who was a, you know, driving a car for a dignitary, came back and told those of us at the front of the banner, they've stopped us because the police warned them to tell us where these were all high school students carrying the banner, uh, middle school and high school students carrying the banner. They wanted to uh, make sure that we were alerted that there was a protest group that was up ahead. We don't know if it was Westboro Baptist Church or if it was a Westboro-like group. Well, it's, it certainly was a Westboro-like group. If that was actually Westboro, then, <sighs> then they should be even more ashamed because they had their horrible hate-filled signs and they had, you know, the screaming people with bullhorns. But what they should be most ashamed of, I think, is that at one point, as we were walking by, just ignoring them, one of the guys with the bullhorn yelled out that we needed to read our Bible because we needed to know that Jesus rained down hellfire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And when people laughed, he got angry and said, no, no, you go do the Google and you find that book of Genesis, Jesus rains down hellfire on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I thought, oh, son, you so need my podcast <laughs> because Jesus doesn't appear in the book of Genesis. In fact, he, he doesn't appear for a while in the good book. <laughs> it takes him a little while to get around to it. Holy smoke. That was, that was the end of it for them. They wound up going and, and leaving early because the laughter didn't stop. It got so bad that the police officers who formed a, a barricade between them and us, and honestly, I don't know who it was to protect. Was it to protect them and their freedom of speech? I'm sure. Was it to protect us from them? Yes, very likely. But the great thing was they had their backs to the speakers with the bullhorns. And, you know, they tried to keep a straight face and be impartial. 
And, you know, they're just there doing their job and we get that. But there were more than a few times where some of them just broke and either started laughing or rolled their eyes or or just clearly had a hard time maintaining that stern air of dignity. Oh, it was it was extraordinary. But it does get to the heart of the why literature is important and why it's really important to know the Bible, because the layers of connection between literature, history, religion, and the biblical texts are so vast, and the tendrils of them go far wide and deep, and we see it in Monte Cristo too. This week's chapter is one of the, it's not even a chess piece setting chapter. I mean, ultimately, it does move a couple of pieces into position. But for the most part, it's a giving us some background information chapter. There are several pieces of foreshadowing in here, and I'm not going to say more than that, and I'm not even going to talk about them on the flip side, because I don't want to spoil it if you didn't figure it out. All I'm going to say is, end of the ball, at the end of the last chapter, Albert runs up to the Count and his mother, saying, oh my gosh, Monsieur de Villefort's here, and he brings news of Monsieur de Saint-Laurent's death. This is Valentine's grandfather, who originally owned the house in Otoy, and Samaran and his wife were the parents of Valentine's mother, the one who apparently died young. Valentine drops like a rock, and everybody's very sad, and they try and whisk her off. Um, Madame Viefort was just fine. Not surprising. Mercedes asks if they're friends, and the Count says, friends, um, don't really have a whole lot of those. I'm always your servant. And as she walks away, he sees her raising her handkerchief to her eyes. And that's when Albert says, don't you get along? And the Count says, didn't you just hear? She called me a friend. And Morel evacuates the premises when Valentine does. That's where we end it. We pick up immediately following at Viefort's house. Now we know Madame de Saint-Morin. She is alive. She's the one who's made it to Paris and has told the family what's going on. So we, we pick up right there. We know that Valentine's future is complicated because she doesn't love the man she's about to marry or that she's being told she has to marry, Franz Epinay, who was in Italy with the Count and Albert. And he's still not in town. He's not back yet. And we know that she doesn't want to marry him. She wants to marry Maximilien. We know that that's complicated. And we know that a further complication to Valentine's future happiness is her grandfather, Noitier. This is Viafor's father trying to manipulate the situation so that she doesn't have to marry Franz. Today we get a lot more complication. Nothing much happens happens, but a lot more complication. So here we go. Chapter 72 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 72 Madame de saint Meron. A gloomy scene had indeed just passed at the house of Monsieur de Villefort. After the ladies had departed for the ball, whither all the entreaties of Madame de Villefort had failed in persuading him to accompany them, the procureur had shut himself up in his study, according to his custom, with a heap of papers calculated to alarm anyone else, but which generally scarcely satisfied his inordinate desires. But this time the papers were a mere matter of form. Villefort had secluded himself, not to study, but to reflect. And with the door locked and orders given that he should not be disturbed, excepting for important business, he sat down in his armchair and began to ponder over the events, the remembrance of which had during the last eight days filled his mind with so many gloomy thoughts and bitter re recollections. Then, instead of plunging into the mass of documents piled before him, he opened the drawer of his desk, touched a spring, and drew out a parcel of cherished memoranda, amongst which he had carefully arranged, in characters only known to himself, the names of all those who, either in his political career, in money matters, at the bar, or in his mysterious love affairs, had become his enemies. Their number was formidable. 
now that he had begun to fear and yet these names powerful though they were had often caused him to smile with the same kind of satisfaction experienced by a traveller who from the summit of a mountain beholds at his feet the craggy eminences the almost impassable paths and the fearful chasms through which he has so perilously climbed when he had run over all those names in his memory again read and studied them commenting meanwhile upon his lists he shook his head no he murmured none of my enemies would have waited so patiently and laboriously for so long a space of time that they might now come and crush me with the secret sometimes as hamlet says foul deeds will rise though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes but like a phosphoric light they rise but to mislead the story has been told by the Corsican to some priest, who in his turn has repeated it. Monsieur de Monte Cristo may have heard it, and to enlighten himself. But why should he wish to enlighten himself upon the subject? asked Villefort, after a moment's reflection. What interest can this Monsieur de Monte Cristo, or Monsieur Zaccone, son of a shipowner of Malta, discoverer of a mine in Thessaly, now visiting paris for the first time what interest i say can he take in discovering a gloomy mysterious and useless fact like this however among all the incoherent details given to me by the abbe busoni and by lord wilmore by that friend and that enemy one thing appears certain and clear in my opinion that in no period in no case in no circumstance could there have been any contact between him and me? But Villefort uttered words which even he himself did not believe. He dreaded not so much the revelation, for he could reply to or deny its truth. He cared little for that mean, tickle, upharsin, which appeared suddenly in letters of blood upon the wall. But what he was really anxious for was to discover whose hand had traced them while he was endeavouring to calm his fears and instead of dwelling upon the political future that had so often been the subject of his ambitious dreams was imagining a future limited to the enjoyments of home in fear of awakening the enemy that had so long slept the noise of a carriage sounded in the yard then he heard the steps of an aged person ascending the stairs followed by tears and lamentations such as servants always give vent to when they wish to appear interested in their master's grief he drew back the bolt of his door and almost directly an old lady entered unannounced carrying her shawl on her arm and her bonnet in her hand the white hair was thrown back from her yellow forehead and her eyes already sunken by the furrows of age now almost disappeared beneath the eyelids swollen with grief oh sir she said oh sir what a misfortune i shall die of it oh yes i shall certainly die of it and then falling upon the chair nearest the door she burst into a paroxysm of sobs the servants standing in the doorway not daring to approach nearer were looking at noirtier's old servant who had heard the noise from his master's room and run there also remaining behind the others Villefort rose and ran towards his mother-in-law, for it was she. "'Why, what can have happened?' he exclaimed. "'What has thus disturbed you? Is Monsieur de saint Meron with you?' "'Monsieur de saint Meron is dead,' answered the old marchioness, without preface and without expression. She appeared to be stupefied. Villefort drew back, and clasping his hands together, exclaimed, dead so suddenly a week ago continued madame de saint Marin, we went out together in the carriage after dinner monsieur de saint Marin had been unwell for some days still the idea of seeing our dear valentine again inspired him with courage and notwithstanding his illness he would leave at six leagues from marseilles after having eaten some of the lozenge he is accustomed to take he fell into such a deep sleep that it appeared to me unnatural still 
I hesitated to wake him, although I fancied that his face was flushed, and that the veins of his temple throbbed more violently than usual. However, as it became dark, and I could no longer see, I fell asleep. I was soon aroused by a piercing shriek as from a person suffering in his dreams, and he suddenly threw his head back violently. I called the valet, I stopped the postilion, I spoke to Monsieur de saint Meran. I applied my smelling salts. But all was over, and I arrived at X by the side of a corpse. Villefort stood with his mouth half open, quite stupefied. Of course you sent for a doctor? Immediately. But as I have told you, it was too late. Yes, but then he could tell of what complaint the poor Marquis had died. Oh, yes, sir. He told me. It appears to have been an apoplectic stroke. And what did you do then? Monsieur de saint Meran had always expressed a desire, in case his death happened during his absence from Paris, that his body might be brought to the family vault. I had him put into a leaden coffin, and I am preceding him by a few days. Oh, my poor mother, said Villefort, to have such duties to perform at your age after such a blow. God has supported me through all, and then, my dear Marquis, he would certainly have done everything for me that I performed for him. It is true that since I left him, I seem to have lost my senses. I cannot cry. At my age they say that we have no more tears. Still, I think that when one is in trouble one should have the power of weeping. Where is Valentine, sir? It is on her account I am here. I wish to see Valentine. Villefort thought it would be terrible to reply that Valentine was at a ball, so he only said that she had gone out with her stepmother, and that she should be fetched. This instant, sir, this instant, I beseech you, said the old lady. Villefort placed the arm of Madame de saint Meran within his own, and conducted her to his apartment. Rest yourself, mother, he said. The marchioness raised her head at this word, and beholding the man who so forcibly reminded her of her deeply regretted child, who still lived for her in Valentine, she felt touched at the name of mother, and bursting into tears, she fell on her knees before an armchair where she buried her venerable head. Villefort left her to the care of the women, while old Barrois ran half scared to his master for nothing frightens old people so much as when death relaxes its vigilance over them for a moment in order to strike some other old person. Then, while Madame de saint Meran remained on her knees, praying fervently, Villefort sent for a cab, and went himself to fetch his wife and daughter from Madame de Morcerf's. He was so pale when he appeared at the door of the ballroom that Valentine ran to him, saying, "'Oh, father!' some misfortune has happened your grandmamma has just arrived valentine said monsieur de villefort and grandpapa inquired the young girl trembling with apprehension monsieur de villefort only replied by offering his arm to his daughter it was just in time for valentine's head swam and she staggered madame de villefort instantly hastened to her assistance and aided her husband in dragging her to the carriage saying what a singular event who could have thought it ah oh, yes it is indeed strange and the wretched family departed leaving a cloud of sadness hanging over the rest of the evening at the foot of the stairs valentine found barois awaiting her monsieur noirtier wishes to see you to-night he said in an undertone "'Tell him I will come when I leave my dear grandmamma. she replied, feeling with true delicacy that the person to whom she could be of the most service just then was Madame de saint Meran. Valentine found her grandmother in bed. Silent caresses, heart-wrung sobs, broken sighs, burning tears 
were all that passed in this sad interview while madame de villefort leaning on her husband's arm maintained all outward forms of respect at least towards the poor widow she soon whispered to her husband i think it would be better for me to retire with your permission for the sight of me appears still to afflict your mother-in-law madame de saint Maron heard her yes yes she said softly to valentine let her leave but do you stay madame de villefort left and valentine remained alone beside the bed for the procureur overcome with astonishment at the unexpected death had followed his wife meanwhile barois had returned for the first time to old Nartier, who having heard the noise in the house had as we have said sent his old servant to inquire the cause on his return his quick intelligent eye interrogated the messenger alas sir exclaimed barois a great misfortune has happened madame de saint Meron has arrived and her husband is dead monsieur de saint Meron and Rattier had never been on strict terms of friendship still the death of one old man always considerably affects another Noirtier let his head fall upon his chest apparently overwhelmed and thoughtful then he closed one eye in token of inquiry mademoiselle valentine Noirtier nodded his head she is at the ball as you know since she came to say good-bye to you in full dress Noirtier again closed his left eye do you wish to see her Noirtier again made an affirmative sign well they have gone to fetch her no doubt from madame de morcerf's i will await her return and beg her to come up here is that what you wish for yes replied the invalid barois therefore as we have seen watched for valentine and informed her of her grandfather's wish consequently valentine came up to noirtier on leaving madame de saint Meron, who in the midst of her grief had at last yielded to fatigue and fallen into a feverish sleep within reach of her hand they placed a small table upon which stood a bottle of orangeade her usual beverage and a glass then as we have said the young girl left the bedside to see monsieur noirtier valentine kissed the old man who looked at her with such tenderness that her eyes again filled with tears whose sources he thought must be exhausted the old gentleman continued to dwell upon her with the same expression yes yes said valentine you mean that i have yet a kind grandfather left do you not the old man intimated that such was his meaning ah yes happily i have replied valentine without that what would become of me it was one o'clock in the morning barois who wished to go to bed himself observed that after such sad events everyone stood in need of rest noirtier would not say that the only rest he needed was to see his child but wished her a good night for grief and fatigue had made her appear quite ill the next morning she found her grandmother in bed the fever had not abated on the contrary her eyes glistened and she appeared to be suffering from violent nervous irritability oh dear grandmamma are you worse exclaimed valentine perceiving all these signs of agitation no my child no said madame de saint Maron. but i was impatiently waiting for your arrival that i might send for your father my father inquired valentine uneasily yes i wish to speak to him valentine durst not oppose her grandmother's wish the cause of which she did not know and an instant afterwards villefort entered sir said madame de saint Meron, without using any circumlocution and as if fearing she had no time to lose he wrote to me concerning the marriage of this child yes madame replied villefort it is not only projected but arranged your intended son-in-law is named monsieur franz d'epinay yes madame is he not the son of general d'epinay who was under our side and who was assassinated some days before the usurper returned from the island of elba the same 
does he not dislike the idea of marrying the granddaughter of a jacobin our civil dissensions are now happily extinguished mother said villefort monsieur d'epinay was quite a child when his father died he knows very little of monsieur noirtier and will meet him if not with pleasure at least with indifference is it a suitable match in every respect and the young man is regarded with universal esteem you approve of him he is one of the most well-bred young men i know during the whole of this conversation valentine had remained silent well sir said madame de saint marin after a few minutes reflection i must hasten the marriage for i have but a short time to live you madame you dear mamma exclaimed monsieur de villefort and valentine at the same time i know what i am saying continued the marchioness i must hurry you so that as she has no mother she may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage i am all that is left to her belonging to my poor rene whom you have so soon forgotten sir oh madame said villefort you forget that i was obliged to give a mother to my child a stepmother is never a mother sir but this is not to the purpose our business concerns valentine let us leave the dead in peace all this was said with such exceeding rapidity that there was something in the conversation that seemed like the beginning of delirium it shall be as you wish madame said villefort more especially since your wishes coincide with mine and as soon as monsieur d'epinay arrives in paris my dear grandmother interrupted valentine consider decorum the recent death you would not have me marry under such sad auspices my child exclaimed the old lady sharply let us hear none of the conventional objections that deter weak minds from preparing for the future i also was married at the deathbed of my mother and certainly i have not been less happy on that account still that idea of death madame said villefort still always i tell you i am going to die do you understand well before dying i wish to see my son-in-law i wish to tell him to make my child happy i wish to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me in fact i will know him i will continued the old lady with a fearful expression that i may rise from the depths of my grave to find him if he should not fulfil his duty madame said villefort you must lay aside these exalted ideas which almost assume the appearance of madness the dead once buried in their graves rise no more and i tell you sir that you are mistaken this night i have had a fearful sleep it seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body my eyes which i tried to open closed against my will and what will appear impossible above all to you sir i saw with my eyes shut in the spot where you are now standing issuing from that corner where there is a door leading into madame villefort's dressing-room i saw i tell you silently enter a white figure valentine screamed it was the fever that disturbed you madame said villefort doubt if you please but i am sure of what i say i saw a white figure and as if to prevent my discrediting the testimony of only one of my senses i heard my glass removed the same which is there now on the table oh dear mother it was a dream so little was it a dream that i stretched my hand toward the bell but when i did so the shade disappeared my maid then entered with a light but she saw no one phantoms are visible to those only who ought to see them it was the soul of my husband well if my husband's soul can come to me why should not my soul appear to guard my granddaughter 
the tie is even more direct it seems to me oh madame said villefort deeply affected in spite of himself do not yield to these gloomy thoughts you will long live with us happy loved and honored and we will make you forget never 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 said the marchioness when does monsieur d'epinay return we expect him every moment it is well as soon as he arrives inform me we must be expeditious and then i also wish to see a notary that i may be assured that all our property returns to valentine oh grandmamma murmured valentine pressing her lips on the burning brow do you wish to kill me oh how feverish you are we must not send for a notary but for a doctor a doctor said she shrugging her shoulders i am not ill i am thirsty that is all what are you drinking dear grandmamma the same as usual my dear my glass is there on the table give it to me valentine valentine poured the orangeade into a glass and gave it to her grandmother with a certain degree of dread for it was the same glass she fancied that had been touched by the spectre the marchioness drained the glass at a single draught and then turned on her pillow repeating the notary the notary monsieur de villefort left the room and valentine seated herself at the bedside of her grandmother the poor child appeared herself to require the doctor she had recommended to her aged relative a bright spot burned in either cheek her respiration was short and difficult and her pulse beat with feverish excitement she was thinking of the despair of maximilian when he should be informed that madame de saint meron instead of being an ally was unconsciously acting as his enemy more than once she thought of revealing all to her grandmother and she would not have hesitated a moment if maximilian morel had been named albert de morcerf or raoul de chateaurenaud but morel was of plebeian extraction and valentine knew how the haughty marquise de saint meron despised all who were not noble her secret had each time been repressed when she was about to reveal it by the sad conviction that it would be useless to do so for were it were once discovered by her father and mother all would be lost two hours passed thus madame de saint meron was in a feverish sleep and the notary had arrived though his coming was announced in a very low tone madame de saint meron arose from her pillow the notary she exclaimed let him come in the notary who was at the door immediately entered go valentine said madame de saint meron and leave me with this gentleman but grandmamma leave me go the young girl kissed her grandmother and left with her handkerchief to her eyes at the door she found the valet de chambre who told her that the doctor was waiting in the dining-room valentine instantly ran down the doctor was a friend of the family and at the same time one of the cleverest men of the day and very fond of valentine whose birth he had witnessed he had himself a daughter about her age but whose life was one continued source of anxiety and fear to him from her mother having been consumptive oh said valentine we have been waiting for you with such impatience dear monsieur d'avigny but first of all how are madeleine and antoinette madeleine was the daughter of monsieur d'avigny and antoinette his niece monsieur d'avigny smiled sadly antoinette is very well he said and madeleine tolerably so uh, but you send for me my dear child it is not your father or madame de villefort who is ill as for you although we doctors cannot divest our patients of nerves i fancy you have no further need of me than to recommend you not to allow your imagination to take too wide a field valentine coloured m d'avrigny carried the science of divination almost to a miraculous extent for he was one of the physicians who always work upon the body through the mind no she replied it is for my dear grandmother you know the calamity that has happened to us do you not i know nothing said m d'avrigny alas 
said valentine restraining her tears my grandfather is dead monsieur de saint meran yes suddenly from an apoplectic stroke an apoplectic stroke repeated the doctor yes and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband whom she never left has called her and that she must go and join him oh monsieur d'avrigny i beseech you do something for her where is she in her room with the notary and monsieur noirtier just as he was his mind perfectly clear but the same incapability of moving or speaking and the same love for you eh my dear child yes said valentine he was very fond of me who does not love you valentine smiled sadly what are your grandmother's symptoms an extreme nervous excitement and a strangely agitated sleep she fancied this morning in her sleep that her soul was hovering above her body which she at the same time watched it must have been delirium she fancies too that she saw a phantom enter her chamber and even heard the noise it made on touching her glass it is singular said the doctor i was not aware that madame somaron was subject to such hallucinations it is the first time i have ever saw her in this condition said valentine and this morning she frightened me so that i thought her mad and my father who you know is a strong-minded man himself appeared deeply impressed we will go and see said the doctor what you tell me seems very strange the notary here descended and valentine was informed that her grandmother was alone go upstairs she said to the doctor and you oh i dare not she forbade me sending for you and as you say i am myself agitated feverish and out of sorts i will go and take a turn in the garden to recover myself the doctor pressed valentine's hand and while he visited her grandmother she descended the steps we need not say which portion of the garden was her favorite walk after remaining for a short time in the parterre surrounding the house and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench then from the bench she went to the gate as usual valentine strolled for a short time among her flowers but without gathering them the morning in her heart forbade her assuming this simple ornament though she had not yet had time to put on the outward semblance of woe she then turned towards the avenue as she advanced she fancied she heard a voice speaking her name she stopped astonished then the voice reached her ear more distinctly and she recognized it to be that of maximilian end of chapter 72 so things are not well in the Viafor household we have the drama of the grandfather's death we now have the grandmother in some unpleasant state. Valentine is not feeling well. And walking in the garden, she hears Maximilian. And that is where we pick up next week. I did want to add one disclaimer. I mentioned American Gods at the beginning of the episode. If you plan to watch the show, I highly recommend that you read or listen to, I think it was 20th anniversary re-release of the book. Neil Gaiman provides an introduction to it for the audible version, and he's a marvelous reader. The reading is done by a cast, which is extremely helpful because there's about a million characters. It's very Dickensian in scope in that respect. It is a big, sprawling, epic book that does all wind up coming back to one central point eventually, but you have to get there first. They're doing, I think, an extraordinary job of taking a very complicated text and making a visual version of it. That said, I think I would be very confused by a whole lot of stuff if I hadn't read the book first. And one of the things I would be very confused by would be the things that would give this a very solid rated R rating if it were in a movie theater. And that may seem really weird when you're talking about gods, you know, a pantheon of, of gods like Greek gods, Norse gods, gods, gods from all over the world, from all of history. 
got Egyptian gods, Northern African gods. I mean, there's they have, there are gods from everywhere. Neil Gaiman does his research. Even if you just look at the Greek and Roman gods, we know from what we've read that those gods behaved far more in a, a human manner in that they were more, more violent, more vengeful, m- more carnal than monotheistic gods tend to be. All the different monotheistic gods that I can think of off the top of my head anyway. So there's a lot of American gods background information that is really, really not safe for work. NSFW, also not safe for children. It's a great story if all you're doing is telling the story, but the details of the story get pretty graphic. So that was just a heads up. Otherwise, really well done. If you've read the book, I think you'll be very impressed. All right, I'm out of here. I'm going to go back and insulate one more wall. (laughs) You have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Take care of each other. See you soon. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.